Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining the webinar. I'm Neha Hegde, an intern at the Nature Side. Welcome you all to our event, Bugs on the Menu, Embracing Ethnic Entomophagy in the Modern World. Before we proceed, I would like to introduce my team members present here. Firstly, our team lead, Ms. Aparna Sinha, and my fellow interns, Sayad Ismail and Abhijit P.S. The Nature Sai, powered by Wildlife Arc, is a group of nature enthusiasts who wish to share their knowledge and experience with the world. They strive to bring informative and educational content from the tiny living world to city dwellers. Our motto is to empower environmentalists by creating opportunities not only for budding environmentalists, but also the people related to this field and also those who want to join through various offline and online programs that we conduct. The Nature Sai works on bridging ecology and economy. We highly appreciate working with ecology and nature enthusiasts who wish to bring change by spreading education and awareness. This webinar is one such attempt within the training and internship program, which we are part of. There are a number of such events lined up for the near future as well. Now coming towards today's event, we have with us today's speaker, Ms. Femi E. Benny. Our speaker is a PhD scholar currently associated with the Insect Biosystematics and Conservation Laboratory at Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and Environment, that is ATRI. Her research interests span in the fields of ethnography, sustainable food systems, entomophagy, and insect ta taxonomy with a specific focus on bees and wasps. Before I hand over the session to our speaker, I request all the participants to keep themselves muted. And if you have any queries, please type them down in the chat box and we will take up all the questions by the end of today's session. Also, all participants kindly note for receiving these certificates, make sure to stay till the end of the webinar. This is because the assessment form for this webinar will be rolled out through the end of it and certificates will only be sent to the participants who fill up that form. Thank you once again, and the stage is all yours, ma'am. Thank you, Nina, for the warm introduction. I'll, I love to share the screen, but um, only when the current uh, poster is closed, I can share my screen. Oh, just a second, ma'am. Yeah. Is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am. All right. So, uh, like as Neha introduced, I'm Femi Benny, and I'm a doctoral researcher in the Insect Biosystematics and Conservation Laboratory at HA Bangalore. And as part of my doctoral research, I've been working on understanding the role of insects in the diet and culture of uh, culture as well as livelihood of ethnic community of Nagaland. Today, I'm going to be talking about endomophagy, uh, bugs on the menu, embracing ethnic endomophagy in the modern world. I'll start the talk by introducing what endomophagy is and uh, the history of endomophagy. So endomophagy, it, is, it means the practice of eating insects. It comes from two Greek words, endomo, which means insects, and phagy, which means to eat. So it's not a new concept or a novel, uh, novel practice or anything. It's a very old practice, which has been practiced in around 200 countries in the world. And in these countries where insects are eaten, they are eaten either as a staple, an emergency food, or a delicacy. So I'll now give a brief history about uh, history of endomophagy. So endomophagy, like I mentioned earlier, it's prevalent from time immemorial. And there have been there are references of endomophagy or track of or eating insects in Christian, Jew, and Islam religious books. One of the earliest evidence of endomophagy comes from ancient Greece, where Aristotle in his book Historia Animalis has mentioned about eating cicadas. He has also mentioned that female cicadas taste better after mating because of the fact of position and development and all that. There are also records of uh, records of uh, evidences of endomophagy in Bible, which is followed by Pliny the Elder and the Holy Quran. Pliny the Elder 
In his book, Historian Naturalis has mentioned about an insect dish called Kosis, which is actually made of longhorn beetle grub. Moving on, if you look at the history of human evolution, archaeological evidence throughout the world throws light over the fact that if in light over the fact that insects have been part of the diet and cultural practices of early humans. So in the form of ancient pottery, painting, artifacts, etc. So for them, for the primitive humans, insects were an essential source of protein and fat, as well as they were readily available and easy to catch. For example, the bone tools recovered from Australopithecus robustus, the primitive humans, have wear marks which indicate that they were used to catch termites. And isotope studies have proved the fact that protein requirement of Australopithecus robustus was fulfilled by insect and animal protein and not plant protein. Similar tools were also found from Homo erectus. Another significant piece of evidence uh, when it comes to insect consumption in the prehistoric times is found in coprolites. Coprolites are the fossilized pieces of ancient humans, and if the presence of insect remains in the insect remains in the coprolites gives an it gives an idea or hint into the fact that insects were consumed since that time. So the analysis of coprolites. gives us an idea about the diet of the individual who produced it. For example, the analysis of coprolites from the caves in Ozark Mountains of the US is strong that, the, strong that there were presence of, presence of ants, beetles, and lice, which shows that these insects were part of their diet as well as their culture. Ancient pottery, utensils, and cave paintings also show that insects were used as a food source during the times of prehistoric humans. Rock paintings and other forms of art Art forms of insects also indicate that, apart from being an important food source, insects were also important culturally and also they had a spiritual significance for these people. For example, the sand people of Southern Africa, who are well, very well known for their cave art, which is which dates back to around 30,000 years ago, they have, uh, ants be they have carved ants, beetles, beetles and bees in their rock paintings. The Aztec and Mayan civilizations have recorded insect consumption in the hieroglyphs. So all these, uh, all these facts or all these examples sheds light towards or indicates that primitive humans depended on insects for their protein requirement. So it has to be concluded that insects as human food evolved or converged from various ethnic communities that are spatially, temporally, and socioeconomically widespread. If you look at the diagram here, the figure here shows a cave painting which depicts collection of wild bees and honey. So it, there are like different sort of cave paintings and different sort of artifacts and utensils and all these things from the prehistoric times, which shows which shows that endomophagy as a practice has been there since a very, very long period of time. But now discuss about why insects are important or why insects as a food or insects as a source of protein has to be promoted. So there are three main arguments when it comes to why insects are important. First one is socioeconomic reasons or socioeconomic benefits, then there are nutritional benefits, and then there are environmental benefits. Let's discuss each of yes, them one by one. Yes? Ma'am, uh, I think the slide is not uh, changing. Oh, okay. I'll just stop sharing and try to uh, share it again. Okay, ma'am. Uh, is this slide visible now? Ma'am, uh, you are on the first slide right now. Yeah, yeah, I'll just try to change it to the current slide and then let's see. Yeah, is this slide, does it change? Yeah, it's fine. All right, all right. All right. Let me just project it. It's visible, right? Yes, ma'am. All right, all right. So I'll just continue. So I was telling that uh, 
uh, we'll talk, I was talking about the importance of insects or why insects are important and why it has to be promoted as a future source of profit. So there are like three main arguments. One is social economic. Uh, excuse me, ma'am. Um, yes? So, so your voice is not audible properly. Like it's very low. Okay. Uh, how is it now? Hmm. Is it I mean, fine? It's still like the volume is a bit low. It's difficult to understand what you're speaking. Oh, all right, all right. Let me... Am I audible now? No, ma'am, it's not audible. How is it now? Yeah, it's much better. All right. All right. Okay, one second. I'll share it again. Sorry about that. It's fine. And also, can you put your presentation on full screen? So, like some of the participants were requesting that. Is it visible? Yes, it is visible now. Okay. Ma'am, uh, there was a request from a few of the participants to um, put it in presentation view. I have already put that in presentation view. Um, for you, it's not in presentation mode, is it? No, ma'am. For me, it is in presentation mode only. Um, Ma'am, I think there is an option at the bottom of the presentation screen that says share the presentation after going to presentation mode. Yeah, yeah, I have done that. Um, so in my window, it's showing in full screen presentation mode only. Uh, okay. One second, let me just... Uh, sharing and then try sharing once again. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how is it now? It's still not in presentation mode, but I think it's fine. We can go ahead with this as well. Okay. Um, yeah, wait. 
So yeah, I think uh, we'll discuss the socio-economic benefits of insects first. Is the screen is the slide changing right now? Uh, Ma'am, it's on slide seven now. Okay, it's supposed. All right, all right. It has all changed, right. Ma'am. Yeah, all right. So yeah. So we know that the human population is increasing on a day-to-day -day basis. If you look at the diagram, you can see that the trends in the increase of human population from 1992 till now and uh, what the projections are in the coming years. So according to the projections made by the United Nations, the human population is expected to reach 9.7 to 9.8 billion by 2050. When that happens, there will be increased requirement of food and feed resources as well. So to produce more food and feed, we'll have to extend agriculture. But at this point, extending agriculture is kind of difficult because of the limited land availability for farming. So if you look at the uh, global, if you look at the new diagram, global land use for food production, you can see that so of, of the total land surface available for Earth, 29% is land and 71% is ocean. Of the 29%, 71% is the habitable land and the rest is glaciers and barren land. Of the 71% of habitable land, 50% of the land is available for agriculture and the rest is forest. So if you want to extend agriculture, it is not at all possible because the land availability is limited. You cannot clear forest and uh, uh, extend agriculture. So when the land availability uh, for agriculture is limited and when extending agriculture is not possible, what happens is like there will be lesser availability of feed resources. When there is and that will result in increased demand for animal protein. When the demand increases, subsequently, the price of animal protein will also increase. When that happens, poorer sections of the society will not be able to access it. This will result in malnutrition among the poorer sections of the society. So a comprehensive solution to this problem is to find alternative sources to conventional animal protein or in general conventional protein. And insects are one of the best alternatives, alternatives to conventional proteins. When I, when I say conventional proteins, uh, I'm referring to uh, the, both the animal as well as the plant protein sources, like the livestock, including poultry, including cattle, include uh, pig, etc. So these are the socio-economic benefits of using insects. Now we'll talk about the environmental benefits of using insects. So If you look at the diagrams here, there are three, four main points to be discussed under the environmental benefits of why insects are a superior protein source or, or why insects can be promoted as a future source of protein. So the first one is greenhouse gas emission. Second one is feed conversion efficiency, land use requirement. And the last one is water use. Ma'am, so, we are on uh, slide eight. I think it's taking some time for the slide to, I don't know, for you guys to see it. Has it changed? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, no. now it's nine. Okay. So maybe I'll wait a bit after changing each slide so that the transition applies to you as well. All right. So uh, I was talking about the environmental benefits of using insects as a protein source. So the first benefit is the greenhouse gas production. So if you look at the diagram on the right, you can see a comparison of greenhouse gas production between insects and other conventional sources of uh, protein. And uh, next is feed conversion efficiency. So when you talk about feed conversion efficiency, it is the amount of feed required to produce one kilogram of edible weight. So you can clearly see that the amount of feed required for insects when compared to when compared to the amount of feed required for and other conventional protein sources, it's very minimal. So similar trend applies for land use as well as water use. So if you look at the uh, if you look at the bar diagram on the left side, you can see a comparison between the feed requirement, land and water requirement, uh, a comparison between insects versus the conventional protein sources. And you can clearly see that insects occupy the least levels in that graph. So the table here, it shows, a, uh, it just sums up the four points that we just discussed, the greenhouse gas emission, feed conversion efficiency, land and water requirement of insects compared with other uh, poultry, pig and cows. 
so that you can clearly see the values occupied by insects and it's no joke it's there is such a drastic difference between the values of insects compared to other conventional sources of protein so these are the environmental benefits of using insects as a protein source so we'll we'll now discuss about the nutritional benefits of using insects as a protein source before that i have uh, at this diagram which just uh, sums up the sustainability of meat versus insects so if you look at it you can see that to produce 1 pound of beef you need 1000 gallons of water 10 pounds of feed and 200 square feet of pasture at the same time to Maybe produce 1 on slide 9 all right all right just let me know when the slide has changed Yes, ma'am. Now it's uh, it's on slide ten. All right. So if you look at this diagram here, you can see that to produce one pound of beef, it requires thousand gallons of water, ten pounds of feed, and two hundred square feet of pasture. At the same time, to produce one pound of insects, you only require one gallon of water, two pounds of feed, and two cubic feet of land. So this is the this is the difference between insects between insects and beef to produce equal amount of protein. moving on we'll now discuss about the nutritional benefits of using insects has the slide changed not yet ma'am okay yeah ma'am now it's on slide 11 all right so talking about the nutritional benefits of insects insects are highly nutritious in that they are a rich source of high quality protein unsaturated fats vitamins and minerals trace elements and fibers so one thing one important thing that has to be noted here is that the nutritional content of insects varies across species life stages and also with the diet that is being provided to the insects so if we if you look at the pie diagram on the right side you can clearly see the different proteins carbohydrates fats and fats minerals and vitamins present in insects uh i would like uh, to draw your attention towards the minerals present in insects like calcium phosphorus iron zinc selenium and copper so insects are a rich source of all these micronutrients and why it's very important is because for the marginalized communities or for the indigenous communities who are the actual practitioners of entomophagy insects or the insect in, including insects in their diet is one re, one very important factor which ensures food security among them moving on Ma'am, now it's in slide twelve. Okay. So, if you look at the bar diagram here, it shows a comparison of the protein, iron, and calcium levels between chicken, beef, pork, and cricket, which is an important edible insect. You can see the level of uh, uh, level of pro how the level of proteins, iron, and calcium is differing between the conventional animal protein sources and the crickets, and the differences are it's a differences are huge. The table below it just summarizes the level of essential amino acids in three of three of the important edible insects and that is compared with chicken beef and pork like mealworm silkworm and cricket again you can see that the level of amino acids insects are a rich source of essential amino acids as well um you are now in slide 13 all right so far we have been talking about the what entomophagy is the history of entomophagy which um, the benefits of using insects as a pro, as a protein source extra so now it's important to talk about which insects are edible so we need to understand which are the insects that are edible which are the insects which are that are consumed by the different communities all over the world so if you look at it maximum number of edible insects are reported from the insect order coleoptera and that includes beetles and weevils this is followed by the order lepidoptera which includes caterpillars followed by hymenoptera which includes bees wasps and ants this is followed by orthoptera which includes grasshoppers locusts and crickets and then there are other the other small insect orders it follows like cicadas leaf hoppers termites dragonflies flies and other small insect orders so these are the different insects which are being consumed all over the world
ma'am you are in slide 14 right now if you look at the recorded edible insect species by country the diagram here the color coded diagram here it shows the recorded edible insect species by country so the areas where there are dense green color are the areas where maximum number of edible insects are being reported so if you just look at that diagram you can see that there are hot spots of endemophagy in southeast asia in australia in africa and in latin america so these are the regions where endemophagy is practiced on a large scale compared to the other regions all over in the world around more than 2 2000 insects are consumed worldwide and in india the number is coming to around 300 So if you look at the Indian map here it's a map of India which indicates insect consumption in different states again you can see that a maximum number of insects are coming from or uh, coming from the northeastern states apart from that there are also some scattered insect co- consumption happening in states like Madhya Pradesh Odisha Kerala Karnataka and uh, Tamil Nadu in Madhya Pradesh the muria tribes of Madhya Pradesh are well known for their endemophagy practices In Kerala, there are communities called Chola Nayar community who are well known for their endemophagy practices. They they eat insects like termites and red ants, and they have they also use insects as part of their traditional medicine as well. I'm slide fifteen. Okay. So we'll now talk about the cultural diversity in endemophagy. Like I mentioned in the previous slide. The hotspots of endemophagy are Southeast Asia, Africa, Latin America, and Australia. So these are the regions where the primitive communities or the indigenous communities, who are the actual practitioners of endemophagy, stay. Apart from that, recently there has been a lot of acceptance and promotion of endemophagy happening in few countries in Europe as well. So now we'll discuss about the different indig- indigenous communities who practice endemophagy and the so few of the recipes that are very famous among them. Ma'am, you are in slide sixteen right now. Yeah. Indigenous communities have a long history of endemophagy. For example, the indigenous tribes of the Amazon rainforest in South America they consume ants, termites, and larvae. Uh, and these insects are a source of protein and nutrition for sev- for these people for several centuries. In India, if you look at the case of India, the Angami and Chakesan communities of Nagaland they have rich traditional knowledge of edible insects. So in Nagaland, if you look at it, there are around 16 indigenous communities. Among these 16 indigenous communities, most of the communities use insects in some way or other as part of their diet. But then again, there are few communities who depend on insect on a large basis. And two such examples are the Angami and Chakesan communities. One interesting fact about these communities is that for these uh, in Nagaland in general, insects like wasps, specifically hornets, are considered as an ethnic delicacy. so when people get sick or when you're visiting someone after a long time they tend to gift insects to them so that shows the importance of insects in their culture so if you look at the diagram here diagram on the right side it shows a ethnic delicacy it's it, it's pork cooked with hornet larvae it's an ethnic delicacy in different parts of nagaland moving on mopping worms a caterpillar species are collected dried and consumed in countries like zimbabwe zambia and botswana and that's a source of protein as well as income for the communities they so uh, on the left right side you can see the image of uh, mopping worms termites and caterpillars are part of identity and diet of maasai community of kenya and tanzania in africa also fried crickets silk moth pupae and water beetles are considered as a delicacy in thailand So, if you look at the first diagram here, chapulín tacos in of Mexico. So, it's an ethnic delicacy in Mexico. It's a signature dish there. And in Mexican language, chapulín means grasshoppers. So, chapulín tacos means in those in those tacos, fried grasshoppers will be put as a topping, as you can see in the image. So, that's another a uh, signature dish. Let's now discuss about what insects taste like. So no. I yeah yeah okay so yeah we'll now discuss about the taste of insects because as humans we always have this inherent tendency to relate uh to relate to different things as in if you're trying something new especially in the case of food if you're trying a new food 
you always have this tendency to relate the taste of that food to something that you know or something that you like or even dislike so i i feel that it's important to know it's important for people to know what insects what different insects taste like so for here i have a table of uh, different insects that i've tried and the and the taste which i could relate crickets the dried and fried crickets as well as the roasted crickets they taste like fried prawns so even while you're cooking crickets that time only you'll start getting the smell of prawns so the taste is very similar to that of prawns grasshoppers and cattails they taste like roasted almonds when they are baked or when they are roasted they have this exact taste and flavor of roasted almonds so they make a, a good add on for for cookies and for biscuits etc beetle grub and some moths uh, they have a very unique and strong flavor so i kind of feel like it's more of an acquired taste on the on the beetle have a very buttery taste so they make good ingredients of soups and uh, foods like that hornets when they are roasted they they t- taste like grilled cheese so they have a very it's very pleasing to the taste buds red ants i think like most of the people already know red ants they do taste like, they have a sour taste and they do taste like vinegar so yeah that's about how different insects taste like we we'll now discuss about the other side of the coin about the risk factors associated with or the side effects of eating insects because it's all also important to know what are the risk factors associated with eating insects just like for any other food item also there will be some risk factors associated with it for insects also it's there and i feel it's important to discuss about that so the bigger question here is are all insects edible and the answer is obviously no all insects are not edible we know that insects are herbi- mostly herbivores and by herbivores i mean insects do eat Uh, feed on the leaves of plants as well as they there are some insects which suck the which suck up the sap of the plants so in general generally there are there is a chance for pesticide bioaccumulation to happen in insects which applies to other li- conventional livestock as well another uh, matter of concern is the presence of anti nutrients so anti nutrients are the secondary metabolites produced by the plants as part of their defense against the herbivores for example the compounds like tannins phytic acid oxalate etc the problem with anti nutrients is that they interfere with the absorption of the normal nutrients in our body that's why the name anti nutrients so it's really important important uh, to know important that in the whenever any new food is considered to be edible whenever any food for that matter is considered to be edible the level of anti nutrients should be below a certain permissible level which is set by the food and agriculture organization so for insects also it's very important that the uh, anti nutrient level should be below a certain permissible limit one good thing about insects is that in the ethnic uh, in the ethnic uh, mode of cooking like uh, boiling roasting um, deep frying etc there are high chances for the anti nutrients to get detoxified during the processing of the food so that's one thing another important point here is allergic reaction in some people so we know that allergic reaction happens with a lot of other foods as well just like that in the case of insects also it might trigger allergic reaction in some people so it is generally advised that people who have already existing allergies to foods like crabs uh, prawns shrimps etc they are advised not to eat insects the reason behind the allergic reaction is the cross reactivity so cross reactivity happens when uh, people who have uh, who have ex- existing allergies to other arthropod food when they consume insects their immune system might uh, uh, might sense this immune system might sense the in- insect protein as a potential allergen and that might trigger an Im- immune response which culminates as an allergic reaction so people who have existing allergies are, are advised not to eat insects also if you look at the figure on the right side uh, you can see mushrooms and toadstools so uh, for a layman i mean if i haven't given the label as mushroom and toadstool both of them will look like mushrooms only so we know that mushrooms are edible and toadstools are not edible so a, a level of knowledge or a little bit of understanding of uh, understanding is required to understand which one is edible and which one is not edible the same applies to insects as well some insects are edible and some insects are not edible so some knowledge of insects is necessary to know which insect is edible and which one is not ma'am slide 19 yes 
we now discuss about edible insects versus rural livelihood edible insect as a natural resource has immense potentials for livelihood enhancement of the indigenous communities if you look at the case of india several ethnic communities of northeast use insects as a source of food feed and medicine if properly developed edible insect trading can generate income and provide a livelihood option for these people also it is important to note that income generated from edible insect it varies from species to species for example if you look at one plate of hornets it it might cost you around one plate means around 200 gram of hornets it might cost you around 500 rupees at the same time one plate of vespula wasp which is also another wasp it will cost you around 150 rupees only so the price of the insect it depends on several factors it depends on the availability of the seasonal availability of the insect the taste also the local beliefs and a lot of things like that so yeah that's one thing that has to be noted when it comes to edible insect trading uh another important point uh, that has to be discussed when it comes to promoting edible insects uh, is that the current knowledge of edible insects whatever we know as of now is coming from the traditional knowledge the problem with traditional knowledge right now is that traditional knowledge is not is usually not coded that means it is transmitted from one generation to another orally there won't be any written records of it so there are all over the world if you look at the ethnic communities all who are, who practice endomophagy there is a current trend among the people to abandon their practices in an attempt to gain acceptance from the western world the irony here is that when the actual practitioners are giving up their practice practices the mainstream communities are actually realizing the importance of edible insect so in this context it's actually important uh, to conduct more scientific studies in order to document this knowledge and also there is a clear lack of policy and legislation concerning concerning edible insect trading and that is one of the major hurdles for the commercial expansion of edible insect trade so for edible insects to be promoted or edible insects to become a medium of rural livelihood enhancement there should be the wild insect collections are not enough there should be uh, insects has to be promoted as mini livestock or there should be insect farming happening so we'll now discuss about insect farming and its potentials the edible insects are currently trending in the food and feed industry there is no doubt about this fact and uh, insects could become the food choice for people all over the world in the coming years and if you look at it if you observe the current trends in the edible insect industry you can see th that there is a clear cut shift from small scale household operations to a multi million dollar industry for example if you can look at the cricket farms of thailand or the way they call it the grillet farms of thailand so as of now there are around 20000 cricket farms in thailand so this has become this has already become multi million dollar industry so edible insect farming if developed properly it can provide both income and employment opportunities to the people as well as a healthy and nutritious food to the customers moving on we'll now discuss about the importance of importance of the need of insect farming as well as the sustainability of the practice so we know that population human population is increasing on a day to day scale we have already discussed that in the beginning of the talk so as population increases the food insecurity also increases and we there is an urgent need to find alternate sources to conventional proteins and insects like we have already mentioned are one of the best alternative to conventional proteins but the problem here is that the current harvest of edible insects it's happening from wild insect populations but right now since uh, there are a lot of efforts by the un by the fao and by lot of european union etc on to promote edible insects or to promote endomophagy and there is a lot of acceptance worldwide to uh, in acceptance worldwide when it comes to endomophagy when that happens there will be an increased demand among the people among the food enthusiasts all over the world to try out insects in to try out insects and also the prime focus of these people will fall on regions like regions which are the hot spots of endomophagy so in an indian context for example it comes to northeast india when that happens since like i mentioned the current harvest of edible insects is happening from wild populations but when they, when there is an increased outside demand this might result in over harvesting of insect bio resources that will put a pressure on the wild insect populations again a solution to avoid this problem is to start insect farming or to promote insect farming we'll also discuss about the sustainability of the practice like i mentioned the wild insect populations will not be enough 
to meet the increasing outside demand for edible insects and the viable solution that we have in front of our in front of us to conserve insects as well as to ensure sustainable endemophagy is to practice insect farming so for that we need to develop rearing protocols for the commercially and nutritionally superior insects and insects has to be promoted as mini livestock and uh, the, there are a lot of benefits when it comes to promoting insects as mini li livestock but so these kind of benefits include one is the ease of rearing insect can be reared on vertical platforms or uh, and not just on horizontal platforms so that will help in saving a lot of space insects has a very short life cycle and the enormous peak quantity so with, within a short span of time you can produce the large amount of protein when it compare when it comes to insects and if you compare that with conventional livestock the production efficiency of insects is much higher and the resource requirements are very less when it comes to land requirement or water requirement feed requirement etc we have already discussed that and insects are highly nutritious so that list will just go on like that so insects as many likes of have a lot of uh, a lot of benefits and the scalability of insect farming is also very pretty pretty good so once uh, a proper rearing protocol is developed it can be disseminated to the ethnic communities and these communities they can be trained to mass rear insects commercially that way their traditional knowledge and their cultural practices can be turned into an income source for them in the form of an alternative livelihood or maybe even a major livelihood moving on we'll now discuss about the barriers the misconceptions and stigma surrounding endemophagy so there are a lot of misconceptions and stigma associated with eating insects in the modern society for example the beliefs like insects are pest insects are carrier of diseases and the thoughts like insects are an inferior food source etc these kind of beliefs create a negative perception and resistance towards endemophagy and it is very important to address these misconceptions and that can be done through education awareness campaigns and sharing scientific knowledge about insects about the nutritional and environmental benefits of using insects as part of food if you look at uh if you look at the right side i have a figure here which just sums up uh, the misconceptions and stigma and also the a solution what is the possible solution so there are two different terms here one is neophobia and one is disgust when it comes i'll first discuss what neophobia is when it comes to neophobia or in this case food neophobia is the tendency to reject or be reluctant to any new and unfamiliar foods it's a very normal tendency or a very normal nature when it comes to humans so you know thoughts or beliefs like insects are anti natural eating insect is a taboo nobody else eats insects or thoughts like you know if i eat insect i'll get judged because of it all these thoughts comes under neophobia and when it comes to disgust you know thoughts like uh, insects come from a dirty habitat if i eat insect i might get a negative experience out of it and thoughts like i might get poisoning uh, if i eat insects all these things comes under disgust so from childhood only there are there is a there is a general perception that insects are creepy crawlies and they are dirty and things like that so the feeling of disgust comes from all this so as comprehend a solution to this will be increasing the familiarity and social influence through social influence so if you can if you can uh, create if you can popularize the ideas that endemophagy or the practice of eating insects is an ancient tradition and uh, you know insects have a lot of protein insects are rich in protein insects are the best alternative sources to conventional protein it is environment friendly it's sustainable it provide it has a lot of health benefits and most importantly popularizing the fact that other people there are other people who eat insects people widespread all over the world there are a lot of people for whom insects are an integral part of their diet as well as their cultural identity lastly it's also important to popularize the fact that insects do taste good so when these kind of uh, familiarity is created and when these kind of social influence is created that will create that will help in developing positive perceptions and also to reduce the resistance towards endemophagy urbanization also has a very important role in creating these kind of misconceptions and stigma what happens due to rapid urbanization is that rapid urbanization has disrupted the traditional food systems and created a disconnect between the urban population and their cultural heritage and as a result of which it's kind of difficult and challenging to promote and sustain endemophagy in urban settings so also uh, to to solve this problem or to a better initiative at this point would be to create serious efforts 
to preserve and revitalize traditional practices within urban environments and efforts has, has to be made to promote local food diversity and also to incorporate insect consumption into the modern culinary trends and preferences if you look at the next slide i have i have this diagram which showcases global willingness to eat insect based products uh is the slide visible yes ma'am okay so this uh figure i have extracted this figure from a 2018 study again it's a color coded figure so if you look at it the areas which have orange color are the areas where the global willingness to eat insect based products are very less and the areas in which there is yellow color are the areas where there is moderate willingness to eat insect based products and the areas which are green in color are the areas where there is a strong willingness to eat insect based product although this is a 2018 study if you look at it currently if you create a similar map for 2023 i'm sure there will be more green patches here and there because there is a major change or shift of perception happening on a global scale if you look at this diagram in mexico the willingness to eat is very strong it's coming up to 71 percentage in peru and thailand Uh, they are both up to 58 percentage and 56 percentage with moderate willingness to eat. Uh, in countries like China, Brazil, USA, UK, Spain, Russia, India, and Australia, the willingness to eat is coming between 30 to 50 percentage, which shows that we have we still have a long way to go. So we need more awareness. We need more education. Education given to people uh, regarding the importance of edible insects and the health and nutritional and all of the benefits of endomorphic. moving on to the next slide before you say i'll never eat insects i think uh, i'll just conclude my talk with this particular slide so i want you to know that no matter so i i understand that no matter what whatever things i have explained a lot of people will not be con con convinced of the fact that insects are a better protein source or insects are a, insects has the potential to be a future protein source so before before you say that i'll never eat insects i want you to know that according to the food and agriculture organization of united nations on an average every year every individual consumes around 2 pounds of insects per year so this accounts from the stored grain pest or from the pests in cereal from fruits vegetables from the color pigments and all these things so there are insects present everywhere in all the kind of foods that you there'll be in for example in stored grains like in rices dals and all that there'll be stored grain pests there'll be the eggs of it no matter how how much you clean it or no no matter how much you try to figure it out there'll be still hidden uh, life stages or hidden larval forms of insects in same, same thing applies to fruits and vegetables as well so it's a well established fact that on an average a human ingests around 2 pounds of insects per year another thing is that if you look at the different uh, um, candy brands i've shown here the mentos skittles tropicana etc one thing that is common in all these uh, is the red pigment so the red pigment in most of the food products is derived from it's called carmine and it is derived from dried processed and powdered cochineal bug so it's derived from an insect so if you look at the ingredients of uh, these red colored food products you can see that there'll be it will be written colored with carmine that means it is derived from the insect cochineal bug and we all have been using honey from a very long period of time and honey is what honey is regurgitated bee worm so i just want to put it out there that insects we all have been eating insects from a very long period of time it's not it's nothing new it's there from time immemorial and till now we have been eating insects and insects are perfectly fit for human consumption and the fact that i am sitting here talking about it and the fact that you guys are sitting here listening to the listening to this talk is a walking talking example of the fact that insects are really fit for human consumption so with that i'll conclude my talk thank you so much If you have any questions, feel free to ask it now. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we can take the questions now. Uh, I'll read out the first question in the chat. It says, right. uh, "Is there any report from Karnataka on entomophagy?" Yes. So in Karnataka, there are few tribes. Uh, I'm not sure about the name of the tribes, but there are tribes, ethnic communities in Karnataka which eat insects. uh and insects like termites insect red ants etc are consumed in different parts of the villages of karnataka 
So yeah, there are reports. Ma'am, uh, there's a question from uh, one of our participants, Mr. Gautam. Okay. Uh, he's asking, is that this process of eating insects affect any places of food chain? Any places of food chain? Yeah, I think he means to ask whether it's affecting the food chain indirectly or directly. Okay, so as of now, when it comes to the ethnic people who are the actual practitioners of endomophagy, endomophagy is going in a very sustainable manner with nature. So, but the problem here is, like I discussed the sustainability aspects of the sustainability issues of the problem is that when there is an increased demand, when there is an increased outside demand, when more and more people are people want to try out insects, at that point, there won't be enough insects or there won't be enough resources to sustain the need. So that which is why we need to develop rearing protocols for the commercially and nutritionally superior insects to meet with the external demand. I hope that answers that question. Uh, we can go to the next question. Um, so Anushri asks, ma'am, since you are studying the same topic, can you please share your experiences on having insects in the palate? Second, uh, can you repeat the question? It says, uh, ma'am, since you are studying the same topic, can you please mm -hmm. share your experiences on having insects in the palate? Uh, so, um, when it comes to my experience, I have started working on edible insects back in 2019. When I started working on edible insects, even I had the same set of uh, um, same set of misconception and stigma. So my notion was like, I can work on it. It's not necessary that I should eat it. But later on, when I understood the importance of insects, when I came across a lot of literature, which showcases the importance of insects, that's when I really wanted to try it out just to break the stigma myself. So it, I feel like in my own personal experience, it's only the initial, it's only the initial, what do you say, like um, effort. So after, once you try it, once you try it at least once after that, it won't create much of a difference. Once it goes into your mouth, it's, uh, it doesn't make any, any difference. Like, like the way I was explaining in the slide where titled, what do insects taste like? So you can relate the taste of insects to the food items that you've already tried. And it's very, there, there is no, nothing like, you know, it tastes very bad or it tastes very wriggly or anything like that. It's just like any other normal food item. I hope that explains it. Ma'am, uh, can I add on to that? Like, yeah, please, please. Ma'am, does it feel like, uh, you know, uh, when a vegetarian is trying to eat meat, uh, he'll have, have some sort of a feeling, you know? Uh, yeah. Can you uh, like relate to that? So, uh, we are not trying to uh, you know put put we are not trying to force people to convert into eating insects what we are trying here is uh, to prom is to promote endomophagy or to promote the practice of eating insects as food as well as as feed so even for vegetarians they can use insects as animal feed that's not a problem right so it's not like you know uh, if the prob the food insecurity that is being predicted it comes uh, in such a way that there will be shortage of food as well as there will be shortage of feed. So, um, yeah, so for vegetarian people, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, I don't think I can answer that in such a way that, you know, vegetarians can eat insects or anything. But uh, so it, again, what you eat and what you don't eat, it's a personal preference and it's a personal choice. But when it comes to promoting insects as animal feed, I think even vegetarians can do, do that. So, yeah. Yes, ma'am. I can agree on that. Uh, yeah. Ma'am, uh, there's a question from Ms. Amrita J. Prakash Group. Uh, she's asking, can we propose this as a global market start with the addressal of food security? So, back in 2013 itself, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations have been 
uh, there have been a lot of meetings happening and there have been a lot of research happening on the potential of insects as uh, future food and future protein source so it's already being uh, uh, promoted and already being suggested as a potential for uh, as a potential protein source for the future so it's already there are a lot of studies happening and there are a lot of research also going on on these kind of things so it's already there Ma'am, what is the uh, current status of uh, insect farming in India? As of now, in India, there are very few uh, decentralized insect farming happening, but there are not uh, big, large-scale, you know, ventures happening. Like if you compare it with Thailand and all that, the way you find cricket farms in Thailand, we we do not have extensive insect farming in India, but there are few small-scale insect farming happening. For example, in Nagaland, there are people who carry out small scale relocation of insects where they'll bring the insects from the wild keep them in their vicinity or in the community forest rear it or leave it for a while and later when it when it's time to harvest they go and harvest it out so that kind of decentralized insect farming is happening we cannot call it insect farming but still decentralized modes of uh, um, keeping insects are happening uh, also when it comes to black soldier fly and when it comes to meal worms there are few people uh, in india there are few people in south india as well who who do it on a slightly commercial basis as well and there are a lot of uh, trials experiments trials experimental trials happening uh, happening here and there to produce animal feed and to produce insect based food products also but then nothing as extensive as the way you will see it in thailand and other south southeast asian countries over to the next question um miss anjali pujari asks uh, hello can you shine yeah. some light upon the uh, oh yeah we just took that yeah the question was repeated uh, so next question uh, how is how is it that when red ants are dried they are so tiny uh the red ants uh, can you repeat that question please uh, yes ma'am uh, it says uh how is it that when red ants are dried they become so tiny so uh there will be like the water content in the insect will be evaporated while cooking it so when they you know uh, and even within red, red ants ecophila there are like different uh, different sizes within the same colony you know the workers and the queens and the soldiers and all these ants will be having different sizes it's not same size so while cooking the water content will be evaporated there will be little bit of just like how it is for other vegetables and other meat sources there will be little bit of shrinking happening when you are preparing it right so during the processing processes it will shrink a bit i think that's the reason why it becomes tiny after cooking ma'am uh, there's a question from uh... uh amrita mm -hmm. jaksh again uh, how okay. can we normalize entomophagy more evidently and uh, what will be the constraints as of now in establishing this okay so to establish entomophagy more evidently it requires a lot of uh, awareness education uh, you know campaigns of that sort it it needs to be popularized on a larger scale so i think a lot of uh, capacity building and knowledge sharing needs to happen to popularize the concept of entomophagy because it's still a novel concept when it comes to a lot of people so apart from the people who are in academia people who are actually working on it there is a lot of neophobia and a lot of discourse surrounding entomophagy even at this point so we need more awareness campaigns and we need more education uh, about the importance of insects and about the role of insects Uh, in food security to address that uh, what was the second part of the question ma'am uh, what are the constraints as of now in establishing this so the constraints is mainly the uh, socio cultural barriers the misconceptions and stigma only those are the main constraints and then uh, when it comes to insect farming or scaling it up into mini livestock there are policy and legal issues as well because as of now insects uh, are not recognized as a normally traded commodity only when insect is recognized as a normally traded commodity 
uh, we can we can have uh, hassle free trade or hassle free hassle free trading of edible insects so though that is one of the major hurdles um another one is obviously like i mentioned the misconception the stigma the social cultural barriers the belief systems and things like that ma'am apart from uh, uh, using insect as a food source what are the other products we can made from insect livestock from insect livestock uh so are you asking about what are the different insect 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 based products that can be developed yeah yeah, yeah ma'am yes ma'am so uh as of now from my own experience what i've seen is that people people make pickles out of insects people uh make dried uh, you know people dry the insects dried insects products are available then when it comes to crickets cricket flour is available which can be used as a protein supplement when you are baking stuffs when you are making cookies when you are baking biscuits and things like that so one is uh, providing flours providing pickles then uh, fried uh, you know fried insects and these are some of the insect based products but again that uh, there needs to be a lot of studies happening on uh, uh, studies as well as experiments happening on developing different insect based products because it's a very novel uh, it's a very novel area developing products out of it it's a very novel area so that needs a lot more of research and a lot more of experiments Uh, to come up with more novel products uh, there's a question that asks in the beginning uh, mom you had said something about uh, insects the records of insects being eaten in islam can you yeah. please talk about it in a little bit more detail yeah so uh, in the in, in islamic uh, religious texts there have there are mentions of insects like honey bees and insects like grasshoppers being eaten Uh, i don't remember the exact uh, exact uh, you know section where it is being mentioned but there are mentions of uh, insects being eaten in islam the same goes for christian religious books as well so yeah there it is clearly mentioned in islamic religious book ma'am uh, there's a question from mr sayan diori uh, okay he is asking whether um, you could recommend some suggestive readings to understand the history and the culture of endomophagy i i can do that so first of all to understand the uh, understand about endomophagy i would recommend uh, reading the uh, newsletter produced by the food and Agri- food and agriculture organization that is one very detailed that gives a detailed account of endomophagy the history of endomophagy and and, and an overall out, outlook of how endomophagy is how it evolved and things like that so one is the you can go to the fao website and you can just type edible insects over it there is there is a section on edible insects and you'll get uh, the you you'll get the pdf form of the newsletters there or if you just google edible insect uh, there are a lot load of papers and a lot of studies coming up uh, or studies already being published and uh, if you if you just google uh, the need for endomophagy or the are insects the future of protein source even my articles will come up so yeah i mean you can just one is fao's article and if not if that is not sufficient you can just google about it and there will be like tons of articles which will come up so yeah if not i can share a few pdfs with you as well i have the contact of uh, I think one of you, Aparna's contact I have. I can share the articles also. It's not a problem. Okay, sure, ma'am. I'll share it with the participants. Yeah. Ma'am, uh, as you have said about the feed production, yes, uh, I can also feel like you, over like a normal person. Uh, eating insects uh, would be very difficult like uh, maybe it will be possible but uh, i don't see it very like uh, in near future it won't going to be happen because still we see it as you know something like uh, awkward thing even we watch some videos where some people are eating and those videos goes viral and uh, like uh, so it would be very very uh, far like presently it it doesn't look like possible so as you were mentioning about the feed 
uh do, do, do you know like uh, like uh, this uh, cats and da- dog food do they this companies do they uh, use insects to uh, to produce such kind of foods like is it been done in india or something like that as of now uh dog food so in, when you when you talk about insects as insects as animal feed so insects can be used to develop feed for uh, aquaculture feed for you know poultry feed for feed for other other animals like dogs cats etc but as of now uh, i haven't come across uh, efforts in india where uh, dog food and cat food is being made out of insects but then experiments are on the way to develop dog uh, to develop uh, aqua uh, to feed for aquaculture as well as feed for um, poultry using insects even uh, we have a experiment going on where we are trying to develop uh, poultry feed and aquaculture feed using black soldier fly larvae so yeah those kind of experiments are on the way but not for uh, dog food and cat food i'm not aware of that i haven't come across that till now but then again if you look at it on a global scale the edible insect uh, or you know ed- insects for animal feed industry is very well developed on a global scale and it's a very promising industry also but in india we are still in the very initial stage when it comes to that Um, and the next question is from Mr. Kishore Shirkande. He asks, mm-hmm. "Are you aware of any death or severe toxic reaction due to entomophagy in human?" I've read toxic reaction occurred in a human being due to eating a striped tiger larva. I'm not sure of the authenticity of this news. Okay. So, um, there are few insects, like I have mentioned in the talk. There, some insects are edible and some insects are not edible. So, before promoting an insect as a as an edible insect, a lot of studies have to be carried out uh, carried out uh, on it. So, when when I say a lot of studies, studies on the nutrient and anal- nutrient composition, studies on the anti nutrient composition. the studies on the possible presence of allergens and all these things has to be carried out so while i was uh, during my field work in nagaland i've come across people uh, the ethnic communities of nagaland where they have mentioned about a painted grasshopper which is being poisonous and people who have and uh, occasional you know tragedies like this uh, which has happened due to eating painted grasshoppers but i haven't come across the striped uh, moth whatever you guys you have mentioned but i've heard about uh, deaths which happened due to eating painted grasshopper so yeah that is one thing there are insects which are not fit for human consumption as well so a level of knowledge is important before trying out uh, trying out any insect for that matter ma'am uh, there's a question from miss anjali pujari uh, okay. asking whether there are any particular courses that exist in endemophagy and if yes can you uh, please suggest so uh, the problem with uh, our current academic curriculum is that as of now to my knowledge there are no courses on endemophagy as such because endemophagy has not yet been recognized as an academic discipline so it needs to be that's why i said that there are a lot of you know policy regulations that has to come in endemophagy has to be like not just endemophagy but you know edible insect or insect for insect as food and feed insect farming in general has to be recognized as a separate discipline of biology only then people can be trained on a very larger scale uh, into rearing insects into understanding the importance of insects ex- things like that so as of now there are no courses which teach endemophagy or which teach about edible insects as such so yeah there are no courses as such so i i cannot recommend anything like that but there are occasional webinars and occasional uh, talks here and there which happens about uh, which happens about endemophagy or edible insects and all that apart from that uh, i think we we still have a long way to go to reach to reach there where there will be like courses on endemophagy or courses on edible insects The next question is from Mr. Duman Talum. Mm-hmm. While promoting insect farming to ethnic communities who are inst- interested to farm insects, how will we make them aware on how to channel them to companies or organizations who will buy their products or help them? Is there any such process? So uh, the the way it is for any new startup, 
there has to be a proper training when it comes to marketing of the product so the same thing applies for insect farming as well when insect farming is uh, be is to be done the first step is to identify the insects which is edible second step is to understand the nutrient composition as well as the anti nutrient composition of that insect once these kind of things are uh, already sorted the third step is to develop insect based products out of it and next step will be to market those products so marketing the communities have to be trained on marketing and how they can cre create maximum outreach for their products so branding and marketing training has to be given just like the way that is being done for any other product so yeah it has to be they have to be trained in that way but then as of now there are there are not uh, from what i know there are no projects as such which is focusing on you know training ethnic communities on branding and marketing of their resources but yeah we we need to have those kind of projects as well ma'am uh, next question is from mr mohammad tanveer um, okay he is asking how you got inspired to study about insects okay uh so i i did my masters in entomology so i have been trained on insects from that time so after uh, if the question is about how i got interested in insects i for some reason i i was interested in studying insects only or in learning about insects only from uh, from the time i took bachelor so i took bachelor's in zoology after that i took a masters in in zoology with entomology as one of the specialization post masters i joined a tree in the insect lab where i was working on edible insects so initially just like how most of you guys will be feel, feeling even i used to feel disgusted and i used to feel irritated about the facts that i i was reading but gradually when i came across a lot of literature when i got to speak to people who used to eat insects as part of their culture that's when i realized the importance of it and that's when i realized it's very normal it's a very normal practice it's just our ignorance that we we don't know about it or we kind of find it disgusting so when i i don't know when i just uh, uh, started reading more about it i uh, the barriers or the misconceptions in front of me it just went away and uh, i became more open about it and later on i also started trying insects and that's how it happened but yeah it's a it's a very interesting subject as well because uh, you get to meet a lot of people with a lot wide variety of customs wide variety of traditions and all that and yeah so that's how i got interested into the subject mr nitin asks uh, ma'am do you know about any government initiatives to commercialize the industry, the insect industry uh so uh, uh in nagaland there is the sustainable development goal Co goal coordination center sdgcc so uh, we are associated with them in one of our projects and uh, what in that through that uh, particular collaboration what they are trying to do is that we are trying to develop a uh, black soldier fly rearing so it's it's like sustainable management of waste using black soldier fly and the so the domestic waste and the kitchen waste and everything it will be treated it will be treated or fed to black soldier flies and the manure that where the flies will just uh, live on it they'll just digest it and the manure that is produced as a result of the digestion it will be used as a uh, you know fertilizer for the plants and the fly larvae that will be produced can be used as a you know um, feed for poultry and all that so there is this circular stuff happening so it's a it's a, it's in a very initial stage right now but that is one of the projects that is being carried out with the help of support from the government the government of nagaland for that matter so uh, that is one project that i i know of where you know a government support is being given to develop an insect based product or to develop an insect rearing on a larger scale so that is one example that i have come across i have been come across uh, multi and other projects of that sort so yeah ma'am the next question is from miss anshrike uh, okay is asking uh, the lack of knowledge seems evident if carmine is present as food coloring in most of our products doesn't it affect veganism it does it does so i would say that nobody is absolutely vegetarian or nobody is absolutely vegan so i mean even if carmine was not there as a food pigment uh, 
as per the studies uh, conducted by the united nations fao like i have mentioned every human or is have consumed or is consuming 2 pounds of insects on a per year basis so i mean yeah it does it does affect me nobody is an absolute vegan or nobody is an absolute vegetarian so for that matter the next question is from miss mamta yadav mm -hmm. uh, can you can you share st a structured questionnaire to ask while studying entomophagy Uh, structured questionnaire to ask so in my uh, kind of studies we use semi structured questionnaires uh, for carrying out the interviews and all that because uh, since you are interviewing uh, ethnic people indigenous people uh, when you have a properly structured questionnaire sometimes it will become it becomes very rigid so i would recommend using uh, semi structured questionnaires semi structured and open ended questionnaires so that you know it becomes very less rigid and uh, it becomes more inclusive to their perceptions and to their ideas so yeah i use semi structured questionnaires only but uh, if i have to uh, share it i can share my email id you can get in, get in touch with me and we can discuss on what kind of uh, questionnaire you you are looking for and I, i can definitely help you out with that so yeah ma'am next question is from miss pooja randas uh, mm -hmm. hello ma'am as we know yeah yeah ma'am uh, ma'am can i uh, ask the question please yeah please please uh, as we know very less about insects and having them as a food uh, how conservation of insects can be done and as as they are the main food producers as they are majorly pollinators uh, i think she is trying to ask uh, since we know less about insects uh, and we are having them as uh, food how, how does the conservation of insects happen as uh, since they are uh, pollinators also so every insect has a specific functional role in the ecosystem so the functional roles of insects in the ecosystem are very important as well for the normal uh, food chain and for the normal balance of the ecosystem so when you are consuming insects as of now whatever consumption of insects is happening it's happening in a perfect harmony it's happening in perfect harmony with the environment because the number of people who eat insects are very less uh, in a in the current context but going forward when more and more people start under uh, starts to recognize entomophagy and more and more people starts to understand the importance of entomophagy that's when the demand for insects are going to increase at least for people who want to try it out for at least once or there will be people who are very adventurous who wants to try it out things like that so when that happens when there is an outside demand for edible insects the focus will fall on prime areas like north east india or you know in regions even regions in south india where insects are being consumed when that happens that will put a pressure on the wild insect population which is why we need to develop rearing protocols for the commercially as well as the nutritionally superior insects so and also i am very aware of the fact that you cannot develop rearing protocols for all the insects that are being eaten so you need to select from the possible from the list of insects which for whichever insects rearing protocols can be developed those kind of studies has to be done so as of now we don't have rearing protocols for all the 300 insects that are being edible in india or for all the almost 2 2000 insects which are being edible in the world so it needs a lot of studies over there so uh, no to when you when you're asking from a conservation point of view uh, to promote the insects uh, to promote the insects and also to prevent the insects from getting affected by entomophagy it is very important to have uh, insect farming or rearing protocols for those insects the next question asks as you mentioned about many developed industries in europe what kind of production are they into is it feed or chemical or uh, which uh, which kind of industry is it so most of the multi multi billion dollar industries that i have come across i have read about are into production of animal feed so the uh, la large majority of the advancements are happening into developing animal feed from insects also there are developments happening uh, 
uh, into developing human food uh, uh, from insects as well one example is the grilled farms which i have talked about so where the cricket flour is being developed and cricket cricket flows are being sold so if you, even in amazon if you check you you will have uh, you know there will be options to buy cricket flour so it has reached that level where you can buy the product the product is already available in the market so these are the kind of industries that are currently um, available when it comes to insect based insect based products but most of the big large scale industries are into developing animal feed not ju- not just human product human food ma'am uh, next question is from miss anshri k again uh, she is asking since insect life cycle is short there is a risk of having dead insects when culturing in a commercial scale so is there any uh, fix to this also there is a risk of cannibalism how is it addressed to so, that depends on what insects what insect you are rearing for example we have cricket rearing in our laboratory we don't find any cannibalism happening in crickets so it really depends on the sp- kind of the, on the type of species that you are rearing whether cannibalism happens or not so that's one thing um what was the other part, second part of the question ma'am can you repeat yeah yeah i'm repeating yeah. ma'am uh, the there is a risk of having dead insects when culturing in a commercial scale uh, mm-hmm. since they have a short life cycle yeah so that applies to other livestock farming as well even in livestock farming for example if you look at poultry there will be sometimes you know there will be dead uh, chickens and you know baby chickens and whatever present so that has to be removed it it cannot be automated completely but there needs to be constant monitoring uh, when there are when large scale farming is happening so i think uh, it it's the part and parcel of the of any large scale farming not just insect farming also other animal conventional animal farming as well so that comes as a part of it i feel the next question is are there any efforts by uh, the government of india in growing this industry uh, i think i answered that question where i was mentioning about the sustainable development goal coordination center in nagaland where they have funded a project uh, include project which promotes the uh rearing of black soldier flies waste management using that and developing of poultry feed using black soldier flies and things like that so that is one of the project that i have come across there might be few others as well but still even at this point we don't have any big budget projects uh, which are in place to develop uh, you know animal feed or human food uh, out of insects so yeah that is yes ma'am uh, the next question is from mr nitin why does china appear on the moderate scale for willingness to eat insects is there any particular reason so like i've mentioned uh, that willingness to eat insects was extracted from a 2018 study so from 2018 to 2023 we have come a long way when it comes to endemophagy and promoting and accepting insects as part of the diet so if you look at the if you look at such a diagram at this point uh, at the, uh, if you look at that diagram at the 2023 point of view there might be more green patches here and there there might be you know a gradual trend uh, where more countries are becoming uh, accepting uh, edible insects and endemophagy as such so since it's a since the diagram was representing willingness to eat and that is a perception and that is a opinion of the people we cannot say what is the exact i, I mean i cannot say what is the exact reason as to why it is moderate or why it is coming into moderate level in china so i mean yeah i i really cannot say what is the exact reason to it there might be a lot of socio cultural factors you know individual factors then what do you say psychological factors a lot of factors uh, results in the willingness to eat uh towards insect based products so yeah it needs uh, i mean i cannot say any conclusive reason as to why it is less in china and why it is more in mexico so yeah ma'am uh what is the potential of using insect as poultry or animal feed okay 
so um right now the when it comes to if you're just talking about poultry industry the to produce enough feed for poultry industry the amount of greenhouse gas emission happening the amount of land and water resources that are being used for that is enormous as a, as we go ahead when the population increases we have to produce more protein sources we have to produce if we have to supply poultry to every uh, poultry to the levels that is being done at this point to the increasing population as well we need to increase the production we need to scale up the production when the product if the production has to be scaled up it needs more space more more space more resources as well as more there will be more emissions so at this point when we are already battling with climate change and global warming it's not a very feasible option to do that so insects at the same time offer a feasible and a sustainable option to produce an equal amount of protein with minimal emissions with better resource utilization and with better feed conversion efficiency so that is the big biggest potential of insect as animal feed or as poultry feed or even as human feed that is the biggest potential of insects i hope that explains it ma'am uh, all of the questions are over uh, i don't think uh, there are anybody else to uh, ask questions okay Mom, um, uh, before we go over to the word of thanks, uh, can you share your uh, email ID with us, Mom? I'll share it in the yeah. chat box. I'll just type it in the chat box. It's femi dot beni at atri dot org. So, if you have any specific questions, or if you want reading materials, and somebody has asked for uh, questionnaires and things like that, you can reach out to me. I'll I'll do whatever help I can. Uh, Ma'am, uh, if there are no more questions, can we? Uh... Move towards the word of thanks. Yeah, sure, sure. Good evening, all. I am Abhijit, an intern at the Nature's Eye. Respected Miss Femi E. Benny, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to express my heartfelt gratitude and extend a warm word of thanks on behalf of our team and the Nature's Eye. First and foremost, I'd like to express our deepest appreciation to our esteemed speaker, Miss. Femi E. Benny for gracing us with valuable insights and her expertise on ethnic entomophagy. Secondly, I'd like to thank the Nature Sci for providing us with uh, an opportunity to learn more about hosting online events as well as webinars. Also, I would like to express my gratitude to all the participants who joined today. So um, this wraps up our event on Bugs on the menu: Embracing ethnic and homophagy in the modern world. Uh, e certificates will be provided to only those participants who fill out the form provided in the chat box. I repeat, e certificates will be provided to only those participants who fill out the form provided in the chat box. Uh, we also welcome you all to attend our online workshop on managing animals in captivity from. Uh, June 26 onwards, all the participants who join today will be offered special discounts on enrolling for the event. Please do check it and uh, stay connected with the Nature Sci for more such events related to the field of ecology and wildlife. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to present this talk and reach out to a lot of people, sharing my knowledge and my research experience when it comes to endomorphology. Thank you. Thank you all for attending as well. Thank you, ma'am, and thanks to all the participants as well. Participants, please make sure that you fill out the form that has been sent in the chat box. 
e certificates will only be given to those mm. who have filled it and make sure that you fill out your current spe correct spelling in the form because the, that is the name into which the certificates will be made which ethnic group in africa is known for Also, the form link will not be shared in the WhatsApp group. So if you're going to fill it later, just uh, save the link somewhere else. And the form will be closed by tomorrow, 8 p.m. So make sure that you fill the form by then. Mm 